Okay. All right. Well, hello. I'd like to thank everyone for uh, being here and asking us to be part of this. Um, my name is Richard Kegler. My associate... Associate? Is that the right term? <laughs> oh, okay. Boss. There's a lot. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I like that. The boss, Amelia, <laughs> and Al and I, we're, we're, present, we're going to present a case study of the evolution of a, of a, of a type form. And um, so I guess we just go into it, right? Let's do it. All right. All right. So P22 type foundry, uh, this is a very recent screen capture of the homepage of our website. And um, it's been a digital type foundry for 25 years. Yeah, I'm not sure how 25 years have passed, but uh, they have. And so the digital type we've done have, have always had some uh, roots in in uh, historical letter forms. Uh, the upper picture is the new P22 studio in Rochester, New York. So P22 is now also a letterpress studio and uh, still settling in. So uh, later on, I'll offer an open invitation for you to come and visit Rochester. But for now, um, it's just a little glimpse of what our studio looks like. That's great. So uh, continuing, Thank you so much, everybody, for your hospitality. This has been a wonderful conference. Um, for some background, uh, me, Amelia, I'm a curator at a rare book library at Rochester Institute of Technology in uh, upstate New York. It's called the Cary Graphic Arts Collection, and we hold uh, large collections on the history of printing and graphic design, as well as letterpress technology. So when I'm not helping researchers or organizing an exhibition, I'm usually teaching students using primary source books, archives, and of course, historic printing presses, little pictures of there. So circling around to the title of our talk, The Seven Lives of a Typeface, I'd like to first ponder a recent quote by Paul Luna. Should we regard physical and photographic or digital type as quite separate media, the first kind material and the second kind immaterial? And if so, is it possible for a particular design to be truthfully translated from one medium to another? Well, I hope today Richard and I hope to offer a response to this, and I think it's been touched on already. Wonderfully, we're all thinking in this hive mind for the conference, this response that is not binary in terms of material or analog versus immaterial or digital when talking about type. Through our experiments, we believe that type can be both things at once in this post-digital environment. And certainly truthful, that, that notion of truth, this translation of truth of a type design will be exhibited in a variety of media across 100 years of technology. For our case study today, we're examining just one typeface that was designed by the American type designer, Frederick W. Gowdy. He designed over 120 different typefaces for letterpress type in his very long career. The Cary Collection, where I work, holds significant archival material by Gowdy, including typeface drawings and correspondence, you can see a uh, manuscript that he wrote there on ampersands recently, as well as photographs, so original negatives, like him working in his studio that shows practices, the books that he owned, and even type that he cast in his own foundry, such as the ampersands here. So it's original type that Gowdy cast in uh, New York State, and even sometimes printing presses he owned. So the Cary Collection holds the Kelmscott Gowdy Press, which was owned by William Morris, but then imported to the United States by Frederick Gowdy. Too. So you, of course, may know a little bit about Gowdy's work because his popular typeface Gowdy Old Style and another one called Copper Plate is commonly uh, bundled on operating systems for computers uh, and system fonts. Just 100 years ago, in 1918, Gowdy published a lettering history book called The Alphabet. For its opening paragraph, he drew this ornate initial capital A. You can see it here. Soon after, he was asked by the head of the American Type Founders Company, a leading 
typeface foundry to complete this design of the alphabet for hot metal letterpress type. This became his 33rd typeface design, and it was called the Cloister Initials. Writing a few decades after their creation, Gaudi noted that Cloister Initials have had a long and useful life and are still extensively used and copied. Piracy has gone on forever, as we know. Uh, he was, of course, alluding to their popularity and inclination to be pirated by competing type founders. But Gaudi was really immersed with discovery from the past and getting inspiration for his own types, taking pieces of our past traditions. He was a keen student of letter forms evident in the European manuscript tradition. He sought out examples when he traveled in libraries and museums all over the world, taking in things like this example of a 16th century manuscript, looking at the proportions, the colors, the ornamentation, how letter forms were created in the past and how he could translate that into his own media of metal type. As a designer of printed material, he was influenced by initials that were migrated from the calligraphic form, as we just saw, into the typographic or printed form. Here we have Renaissance examples, which are so important to his education, like these Crible initials by Robert Estienne that were done uh, in the 1500s. Carey Collection has a horrible 19th century scrapbook where somebody cut these all out and pasted them. And this is an example of that page. Good slide though, right, don't you think? Um, Frederick Gowdy was also deeply impressed by the accomplishments of the Kelmscott Press in reviving the aesthetics of Renaissance typography, that he was so impressed with them that he was often inspired by this in his own work. You can see in comparing this Kelmscott page layout on the far left here, um, with his own drawing for an initial O, and then the proof of the, the print that was generated from that drawing. These are in the Carey collection. And truly, these two endeavors, Gowdy and William Morris's work at the Kelmscott Press were only 15 years apart in the historic record. So there's a lot of wonderful inspiration that crosses only just a, a decade and a half. Now, to, returning to these cloister initials, they were very popular. Um, American type founders kept them in production as foundry type for many, many years after their initial release. Uh, in 1993, a former curator at the Carey Collection, where I work, was able to purchase the original matrices for just the 120-point size from a liquidation sale that happened in uh, New Jersey for the company. And from what I hear, and there's a, an article published about it, it was a free-for-all where there was curators, collectors, type founders, and scrap metal men. And so these matrices were saved from the scrap metal dealers because that early 20th century brass is very high quality. <laughs> um, I'm going to return to this notion a little bit later in our presentation. But the last thing I'll say about the deep history of this typeface is that Cloister was migrated for different typecasting technologies. By the 1930s, they were renamed Gaudi Initials number 296, for the automated monotype system. And that is a good segue right now to hand it over to Richard so he can explore more recent iterations of this typeface. All right, thank you, Amelia. So uh, I wanna talk a little bit about technology evolution and uh, this, this is maybe an interesting segue from hot metal to between we talk about digital we talk about metal one thing that doesn't get talked about much is phototype setting and this was a the history of phototype setting is not very well documented this i think is utterly fascinating and if you know linotype technology and you know what a linotype mat is um, these are very curious objects because there's a little piece of film embedded into the side of each of these linotype mats which were originally designed to cast type um, the fact that these machines and even the linotype machines worked are, are just the mechanical marvels that these things were were, were, were truly incredible. 
Um, so phototype actually did adapt the cloister initials and you can see it, it says 72 point. Um, what the origin was of these initials and what they actually looked like, we haven't been able to find out. These are um, the only source of phototype cloister initials have been able to locate. Um, so if anybody knows of any any other sources, I'd be interested to uh, look further into that. Um, but we're going to jump to digital a little bit. And uh, Giampa Textware, also known as Lanston Type Company, was a, a late 1980s uh, invention of a fellow named Gerald Giampa, who did end up acquiring the remnants of the Lanston Monotype Company. Uh, the history of Lanston Monotype versus Monotype. Everybody knows Monotype, the big company that owns all the foundries, almost, <laughs> almost all the foundries in the world. Uh, so early on, the two companies split. So there was English Monotype and there was American Monotype, which was Lanston Monotype. So as Gerald acquired the, the, the physical assets of the Lanston Monotype company, he, he eliminated using the word Monotype for clarity and legal reasons. Uh, but he did, in 1981, introduce uh, his cloister initials, which were not offered as a font per se. They were offered as individual EPS files. The outlines were so complicated that offering them as a font it just made it a little bit too difficult to, to pull off. Um, and kind of going through some of the history here of the evolution, I, I focused on one individual letter, the B, um, just because it had to start somewhere. And well, the, this uh, 48 point initial. So this was cast by ATF at 48 point. And if you compare it to the 120 point, I'll go back and forth. You can see if you look at the the floriation around the edges, it, it changes slightly. So the source drawings would have been slightly different. They were they were made for a different size. So in a way, these were optical sizes for these initials. There weren't a, there was not a master pattern. Um, the flower in the center again changes quite a bit. So you can see again that was just the difference between the 48 and the 120. Um, Gerald's EPS files. You can see there's a simplification going on, and not only a simplification. Uh, kind of a blobification. So you can actually kind of know, if you know what auto tracing is, you know what, what can happen with Bezier curves when you're trying to draw things, you'll see that, again, the difference between it, the, the original inked specimen uh, with slightly, you know, you can see some details of the ink and the uh, grayscale beyond just black, and then the pure black or white of the EPS file. So um, that initial imported into the latest version of Adobe CC. I'm going to go back and forth here again. You can see some things change a little bit, aside from the size changing slightly. It's, it's pretty much the same, but you see some of the outlines change a little bit. Tech, different software technology will treat, especially older uh, Bezier drawings. And then after the Adobe CC, I tried importing it into FontLab. <laughs> And the points were all forced into a fixed grid. And I thought, this is great. This is really good. So um, it, something totally unexpected happened. But again, this is kind of, uh, of, a, of an interpretation of a translation of one technology to another. Of course, it can be imported in another way. It's just the way I happened to import this. This happened. And I just thought, OK, we're going to look at this just as a point of reference. But it's, it, that's like my favorite one. So. Um, so we're going back to the Gaudi's EPS file. And of course, uh, in digital technology, there are different versions of, of, of any given historical typeface. This EPS compared to this a Gaudi initial in by Dieter Steffman, Steffman in 2000 is curious because if I go back and forth, you see the sort of little, little blob up here. It's almost exactly the same. And some of these other strange things that happen with the, oops, with the leaves are almost identical. So I'm not going to say he just opened up Gerald Giampa's EPS files and put them into a font. Yeah, I'm going to say that. <laughs> so there's Dieter's. Okay. And then also there's our cloister initials from Fonthouse. Uh, Mark Salzberg, the owner of Fonthouse, was at that ATF auction and he bought the 120 point. Uh, or no, the 144, the largest mats he bought. Um, he claims to have digitized them from that. But in looking at this, this is not actually from the 120-point 
version. But you can see the sort of outline, the little bumpiness from the artifacting from a, a letterpress print that was maybe not on smooth copy paper. It's just a, what people might expect to look a digital version of what letterpress looks like. Now, another digital version, PF, Gaudi initials from Parachute 2005. I'm showing you the B as well, just, just again, for comparison, uh, the Fonthouse version. And yes, these are, it looks like it's rotating. Um, I believe the Fonthouse one is a little, little off kilter. I'm not saying it's, no, no. Well, anyway. You can draw your own conclusions on all of these things. What I, um, but the Fonthouse compared to the Parachute, and again, Parachute did something interesting, of course, they're, Greek. So they did a complete set of Greek capitals, which are, I think, very faithful. I don't have one to show you, but you can always look it up online. And then, uh, for those of you who don't, don't know, uh, Gerald Giampa had contacted P22 in uh, around 2004 and offered his Lanston digital library. All the physical assets that he once owned were pretty much wiped out in, in a awful tale of, 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 uh, mistreatment and, and neglect. Um, but his digital assets, P22, did acquire. So one of the first things we did was redraw the Gaudi initials as a font as opposed to EPS file. So we put out our own version of the EPS file. So again, you're looking at it and the edges, they're kind of wonky. That's not good at all. Um, but the intention was to simplify those outlines in a way that could be used as a font. So any of these look great at, you know, 72 point Maybe you can get down to 48. They look pretty good. But if you blow it up to, this is what, uh, 8,000 points here about, roughly. Um, it doesn't, you know, you, you see the imperfections. So we actually did redraw it in 2014. Again, that drawing versus this one. This is much cleaner. And in a way, it's, it's almost, I won't say it's too clean, but it's a very clean drawing. And we wanted to work from the best possible sources. So in order to do that, I tried to find a complete set of the largest possible initials. So I, I contacted my associate. Boss. Boss. <laughs> yeah, now <laughs> boss. Uh, uh, at the Carry Collection and realized that they had a complete set of 120-point mats. I thought, this is great. This means I can just digitize them. No, the mats are what the type is cast from. So the only way to get a good impression, I would have to actually cast the type. Hold that thought. You have two more slides before we show that. I do. Oh, yes. okay. uh, how do you know what I was going to say next? Oh. <laughs> we rehearse in different ways. So in addition to, because this is digital, you can do whatever you want, right? Um, in addition to the, the main uh, type itself, we also worked on the fill portion as opposed to just an entire fill kind of left the openings for the, for the tendrils of the the floriation and the floriation itself. And then, of course, so you can combine and make your own versions of uh, illuminated initials. And so this is the end result of the. Are, are you going to jump in? No. Oh, okay. okay. Gaudi would be proud of you to do this. I think you would I think you'd want a commission of yeah. some. Yeah. Okay. So um, the process of casting the type. Um, my, in, my inquiry to the Carey Collection was that we do have these and uh, a couple other asking around. I discovered there was a, a fellow in uh, Piqua, Ohio named Greg Walters who had the one machine from the American Type Founders that was known to be able to cast up to 144 points. This was a giant pivotal caster and it was known as a deadly machine for good reason. Um, employee of American Type Founders was actually killed by this machine. It would not pass safety standards of today's, uh, uh, yeah, this, you wouldn't see this in any school. So as far as I know, and Patrick might be able to answer this question, are there other pivotal casters that can cast that size mat? Uh, no. Okay, so, <laughs> so thank you, that was good. That was the answer I was going for. Uh, so as far as I know, this is the only machine that could possibly cast these type and asking Greg, he was obliging in casting these. So to make this, aside from just getting a proof, of course, I'm an entrepreneur as, you know, P22 is a company. I've got, a, got some sales materials scattered around this whole exhibit. And it's kind of guerrilla marketing. Um, uh, we decided let's do a limited casting. And um, 
the one condition of borrowing the maps from the Carey collection was that I document. And I put together a very short film, has never shown anywhere. No one has seen this other than Carey collection. So you'll get to see the process of casting. Uh, if you've ever seen typecasting, monotype, even hand casting in a hand mold, this is nothing like that. This is <laughs> frightening beyond all belief. And uh, as you start playing it, uh, there's there's a, a, a longer intro than necessary. So Today. Yeah, you start playing. So um, we'll show you the short film. And again, we'll segue back into our talk, but I'm happy to answer other questions about this process of casting that Greg Walters had done. He's a, he's a collector of equipment. This is not his, that's his, this is his hobby, but he has uh, quite a few casting machines. He did own one of the only four color Vandercook. He actually had two four color Vandercooks. I think he just sold one. Um, so let's see. I haven't seen this other than on a laptop, so we'll we'll see how this. This is the world premiere. <laughs> yes, in fact, it is. This is where we start with the mold open and we have to clean every surface off so the mold will lock up tight. If there's any little piece of metal, stray metal, it will prevent the mold from locking up tight and we'll get a little bit of flash or also squirt one or the other. So the top half of the mold comes down on top of the bottom half, it's a pretty tight fit. Next thing is that we put this mechanism up in place, which has cams that lock down the top to the bottom, make it one piece. And the next thing is we're going to put the mat in. So we've got the cloister initial. T, capital T. It fits in and makes it tight. Now we're putting in a steel backing plate behind the mat. The reason is we're going to put a lot of pressure on that mat and we don't want to take a chance of deforming the mat. We want the pressure to be right in the center of the letter. And if we were putting pressure directly onto that brass mat, it might bend it a little bit, we would not be happy about that at all. So we've got this 3 8 inch piece of steel that fits behind there and it will take all the pressure. This little rig is a replacement for the original ATF mechanism which is missing. We, nobody knows exactly what was supposed to be here. Theo never worked on this machine so he really can't say exactly what was supposed to be here, but there's some kind of mechanism for applying pressure to the mat. Wiggle it around and keep tightening it up until it doesn't wiggle. At this point, the whole mechanism is all locked up and it's ready to pivot up to the nozzle for casting. Cam doesn't work very well. Now we turn on the Machine. Yeah. Turn the power on.
hydraulics off. The machine buzzing now, which means the uh, electrics are heating again. We release the thing, we have to hammer it to break the jet. Take off this mechanism first. got a really good cast with no flash at all. Excellent. This is the best one of the day. And we got it on film. Excellent. These tend to stick in the mold. I don't know if you can see that, Rich. You got a picture yeah. of that. Yeah. But there's just the tiniest indication of flashing around the edge and that's just perfect. So they normally don't want to come out by themselves. So I grab a hold of it and put a piece of wood on it, tap on it like Beautiful piece of type. Wow. Yeah. Alright, so this is another chance to destroy a piece of type. I have to knock the jet off before we can finish the type. I'm going to hold it down. Whack it with a hammer. Sometimes it comes off. Whack it enough times and it comes off. Now we have to mill out the groove and put the foot in the tight. Okay. okay, so now we need to plow the foot on this piece of tight. We're not actually going to plow the foot, we're going to mill the foot out. The machines for plowing were probably lost at the ATF auction, so we set up a drill press here with a milling cutter and a, and a drill vise and an XY base used wood here so that we don't scuff up the type in any way. So I'm going to lock up the type in the vise. You can see this is where the jet was and we're, we need to mill that out a little bit deeper than the base of the type, which would be exactly what you would have got when they plowed the type. So we have the milling cutter coming down. As you can see it's a little bit low. I'm going to turn on the cutter and we advance the type through. As you can see it's cutting a groove in it. See, we now have a nice, beautiful foot plowed into the type. We will go ahead and sand the bottom. There may be little rough edges in places. There's a little lip there, which actually is caused by the type caster mold being a little worn. This capital F is looking good, ready to print.
So as a custodian in a printing history collection, when I saw this video, I was horrified. <laughs> Because, I mean, these are irreplaceable mats, right? It's like the negative of a photograph. It's what you create the printing material from. But now that, I mean, it's sat for a little while, several years afterwards, and I've really come to realize that what my library is very interested in doing is preservation through use. So making very careful and concerted efforts to use this material and to reuse it in, in very measured ways um, and to take every step to be very conscious and treat it like a museum artifact. But also, it is industrial material. So if we can't use it, if we just have these collections of mats sitting in our library and we can't recast and reinvigorate a typeface, then what use is it? I really, um, I, I, I actually applaud you for bringing that proposal to us because I would never have thought that it would be possible. And it was an interesting way to source all the different uh, people and who were needed and the technology in, uh, involved. So we could actually document this process in a way that ATF never did. So that's a real service to printing history. So thank you for making that video. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> did you see the burns on the face of the, uh, of the face of the, the mask? Were they? I think they no, are. No, we got them like that. Did, we... Did you get them like yeah. that? <laughs> I have photographs, you know. Uh oh. No. So, um, so I think that you can agree we've really explored all the different iterations of this cloister initial typeface. Um, it had so many lives so far. First released as physical metal type, of, as you've seen, in various formats in the early 20th century. And then translated into immaterial light as phototype mid-century. And then Rich showed even the more recent uh, digital immateriality in the type forms inspired by this design. But we're also makers, too. And we'd like to bring our case study full circle and show a lot of experiments in the materialities of printing the cloister initials using a combination of computer-aided design and analog printing processes. So, Rich is going to talk about the first iteration of the new material. Okay, so we actually have pieces here you can look at after the talk as well. So everything we're showing from here on in, you'll, you'll be able to handle. Magnesium photo engraving. Again, this could have also, this is uh, on magnesium. It could have been copper just as well. So a chemical etching, the process is over 100 years old. It's not necessarily a new process, but it's a process that can still be obtained uh, from a computer file, as, as all of these will be showing are. Also, um, laser engraving on end grain wood. Uh, Scott Moore had uh, I asked him to if he could cut one for me so he cut six for me in varying degrees and what you get the edge of the the laser uh, just like the 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 blade of a saw uh, you have to account for kerf or the amount of material that is cut away in in the cutting process so with laser again something like this that has a, a positive negative foreground background uh, you have to get just the right amount of cutting away so that you have this, this balance. So these are sort of the two extremes of that uh, laser cut. Uh, of course, this goes back pre-type with uh, hand-carved uh, wood engraving. So xylography that uh, these could have been hand-carved, but the laser was a little easier for us. Um, um, and so just a few weeks ago, right around Christmas time, uh, I started printing 3D trials of the cloister initials using the RIT fabrication lab. So this is a, a lab in our art school that has 3D printers, laser engravers, CNC routers in it. Um, the most successful results were derived from the stereolithography process, which creates 3D objects by successively printing uh, thin layers using a liquid plastic medium that's cured by uh, ultraviolet light. So this is the uh, Form Lab Form 2 3D printer. It's, a, it's about the size of a microwave oven. Um, but what you can see here inside of, of this 
protective cover that shields the viewer from the UV light, there's actually a bath. It's like a bath of resin that's liquid. And so layer by layer, that liquid is cured by the UV, working successively from the bottom to the top. But it's also held by a scaffolding called a raft. And you can see that here. Um, it's, I think, fascinating to see this kind of modeling. The best piece of type that we printed using stereolithography took six trials. It's about four hours each to print. The raft had to be cut off with pliers here. And I was really reminded of Greg Walters cutting off that jet of the type of pier. And actually, that was Rich's job when you were casting those 700 pieces of type. Yes. Bang! So um, type handled so rough, we tell our students to be very careful with the typeface. Mm -hmm. But we didn't realize that there's so much hammering going on. Um, and I'm also reminded of all the type trimming that had to be done since hand casting was invented centuries ago. So really, the more things change, the more they stay the same in a way. In summary, the best piece of type that we were able to get uh, was stereolithography block number one here. And uh, we stipulated that the resolution of the material deposited was 50 microns per layer. So if you contrast that with like 150 microns per layer in block number two, that floral detail is so greatly reduced in the surface of that type. It, it just wouldn't, would not keep the resolution of an original cloister initials uh, character. So we also tried the more popular, and I think we've seen that today uh, with Lucretia's uh, talk, the fused deposition modeling, FDM, where we tried this, but these are evident in blocks three and four. And here, this fil filament of thermoplastic material is fed from this large coil through a moving heated printer extruder head. And it's deposited on the work as it grows also from the ground up. The 3D printers in FDM technology that were available to us just could not hold the resolution and all of the floral detail was lost, especially in all the intricate scroll work. Actually, uh, I know Richard loves this, and so we got to print this sometime to, to show that kind of digital artifacting that can happen. <coughs> okay. So, again, a, a more uh, common uh, method of converting digital to analog is uh, photopolymer plates. And uh, we're lucky enough to have Boxcar Press uh, about an hour drive. So if we're in a hurry, we can send the file. I was going to say over modem. Wouldn't that be funny if we still use modems uh, through email? Somebody's and, going to do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> modems are coming back, I hear. Um, so again, this uh, f uh, a base that uh, a small adhesive piece of plastic is adhered to. Um, and so these are our results. Um, we actually have uh, managed to print a piece with, because that was the goal. These are letterpress blocks. We need to print them. So we did print them into a piece, and we have some for you because everybody likes swag. Yeah, get away. And, and so we, we've also perforated them. It's, it's uh, some vintage gummed paper material. So if you're a philatelist, meaning you like stamps, um, there you go. Um, so we, we'll also talk a little bit about the, uh, our results. Well, I think that um, as you get them, we really want to encourage you to be the judge. I know this isn't the best light, but um, we're all letterpress printers here. So I really want you to tell me what you think looks good as, as perfect kiss impression and what has some issues, just like I think Richard did with his, his digital uh, summary of cloister initials. The, um, the challenge I want to lay out there first to tell you all is that our experiment is a little flawed because as we printed this, we realized that we should have printed all the same character, right? All the same one. However, you know, this makes a nice keepsake, right? So we, we kind of went design, you know, Porto, right? Um, so that's one area where we should have stuck to one character and made a big comparison. The second thing is that 
Uh, the first impression was the was the the photopolymer impression in black, and you can see that in number four, which is a T. Uh, and afterwards, being designers, also we said we need to add some color, just subtle color. So uh, we did have a silver impression for the rest of the them. And so the other characters will be, there's a little bit of a sheen, and we move that to black towards the end of the run. So that's a little bit of a flaw, I think, if we tried it again. That's okay. Right. However, results. Results. So um, we feel that the, the best results were probably a tie between the actual metal type and the photopolymer. Harold Kyle will be very happy for us to say that because he's the owner of Boxcar Press, and that's what he does. He makes photopolymer. Um, the, the all of the surrounding type was photopolymer as well. So nine point italic Garamond holds up pretty nicely. Uh, I'll print it on a Vandercook press. Um, the next level, um, which is still pretty good, we felt the the wood, the laser cut wood, and the magnesium were probably about on par. Those Both of the O's were printed by those two processes. And the least successful results, the ones that required the most make ready, was still the the, uh, the stereolithography. Um, you can see a little bit of a diagonal hash mark in the top of the P. And um, again, after the talk, you'll be able to look at the actual pieces. Um, but that, that's what we've observed. Yeah, and I think it has to come down to, um, who are we talking about? Consistency and reliability. So that, that metal type and the photopolymer were ready to go right from the beginning of printing, you know, after we got the ink running up and uh, we got the impression correct. But the rest of them needed so much make ready on the back in order to effectively print them and have... Um, comparable results even even to those older processes or newer processes so the the magnesium block the company they this is what they do you get the block and then you look at it and realize it's canted a little bit and then you have to fix that on the press so again this make ready this time that you have to spend to to make sure that it's printable um again metal type is pretty good <laughs> there's a reason right they perfected that right a long time ago um <laughs> Yeah, so right. I I think we're almost done talking now. We could start talking about our print. But uh, I want to close today, and I'd like to bring up the concept of the cradle days of printing. You all are familiar with this term. It's the incanabula period in Western history, which is known as that first 50 years of printing with metal letterpress type from about 1455 to 1501. So during that time period, so this amazing innovative technology, printing, letterpress printing, drove the design of many, many new typefaces as printing spread from Germany around the European continent. Even printing practices were established, um, and even the rules for designing the page, and all of those practices so influenced the printers of the next few centuries, and even we're living through that tradition today, even today. So I just want to remind everybody that we're all living through the digital incunabula period. Some people say digital really started in 1985 with the availability of desktop publishing equipment to the consumer market. So I think if we were to give this talk at the end of digital incunabula, when type moves so freely on the screen without even thinking and programming, or when it is converted instantaneously to 3D, in any different kind of medium or substrate, say 2035, that Gaudi Cloister's initials will have twice as many lives to brag about at the speed of technology. And I predict that those binary differences of material versus immaterial, analog versus digital, will be so blurred as to not even matter anymore. Thank you. Hope we got it. Thank <laughs> you.